because he's going to talk in the second part of the session. So a very warm welcome to everyone here. Today is uh, the second session of the lecture series titled Emerging Sensing and Computing Technologies to Address COVID-19. And today's session is titled Importance of Bioinformatics and Big Data to Overcome the COVID-19 Pandemic. Our guest uh, speakers in uh, today's session is Dr. Mohammad Ali Moni, Research Fellow and Conjoint Lecturer, University of New South Wales, Australia, and Dr. Rishad Shofik, <laughs> Associate Professor, Electronic Systems, Newcastle University, UK. And the session chair would be me, Dr. Asim Shahuddin, Chairperson, Department of Tripoli, Green University of Bangladesh, and Professor Dr. Mohammad Jaidul Islam, Professor, Department of CSC, Green University of Bangladesh. This whole uh, lecture series has been organized by Green University, IEEE Computer Society, uh, GUB Student Branch uh, Chapter, and also IEEE GUB Student Branch. And the event is supported by IEEE Computer Society Bangladesh Chapter. So in the very beginning, I would like to uh, request our Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, Dr. Mo Professor Dr. Mohammad Abdul Rajik Sar, to give an opening uh, speech. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. S. M. Shehabuddin. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure to see uh, Green University uh, student branch for IEEE Computer Society and IEEE uh, student branch of Green University of Bangladesh uh, is organizing uh, such a very technical and timely uh, seminar talk on emerging sensing and computing technologies to address uh, COVID-19. I come to know that the learned speakers today will talk on uh, big data technologies and the bioinformatic technologies, uh, how to address uh, the COVID-19 using those cutting edge technologies. So I do highly appreciate uh, the effort made by our uh, speakers, Dr. Rishad Ahmed Shafiq and Dr. Muhammad Ali Moni. Uh, they are the pioneer researcher in this field, especially we feel proud of them that they are from, they are graduated from uh, universities of Bangladesh. And we are really happy to see them here to share their thoughts, ideas, their works uh, with the Bangladeshi young researchers. And uh, we also keep collaboration with them uh, so that now and often we can exchange our ideas uh, uh, for the betterment of the technology. As we know that uh, many people across the world are trying to innovate uh, new ideas uh, to address the COVID-19 uh, from the uh, technical perspective, more uh, uh, specifically uh, from the electronic devices and the computing technologies. And we believe uh, today's discussion will be uh, uh, a very informative one and directive one to create new knowledge. I also thank uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University of Bangladesh. Out of his extreme business, uh, he has been uh, able to make some time for us to uh, inaugurate this session. Thank you with these few words. Thank you, sir. <laughs> now, now I would like to request our Honorable Vice Chancellor of Green University of Bangladesh, Professor Dr. Mohammad Ghulam Samdani Foki, to share with us a few words. Thank you very much. At the very outset, I would like to uh, say that it's a really an uh, honor for me to uh, join in the session. Being a non technical person, I'm very much keen to. Uh, see how the, uh, the outcome of these lecture sessions. Respected chair of the sessions and learned speakers, Dr. Rishad Shafiq, Dr. Muhammad Ali Mani, and our honorable co-vice chancellor, Professor Abdul Rajak, and our distinguished listeners who are attending this uh, seminar. Good morning and welcome to all of you for these wonderful sessions. I personally believe that considering the present uh, pandemic, COVID-19, uh, and considering the fourth industrial revolutions, 
the importance of bioinformatics and big data is going to play a big role for identifying these some kind of devices through which you can really prevent uh, from this pandemic. And I'm sure that today's presentations will going to highlight some of the important areas uh, of conducting research and it might find out some ways through which uh, we can really address the challenges that we are facing because of the COVID-19. And I do believe that our learned speakers, based on their personal wisdom and experiences, they will come out with their wonderful ideas how we can really uh, address those issues. But at the same time, I'm also expecting that uh, uh, both these you know, prestigious universities, they might also open up so that we can have some kind of collaboration with them for continuing our research work jointly with them. And with these three words, I would like to welcome all of you again here, and I wish all the success and meaningful contributions from our learned speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So now I would like to request uh, Professor Dr. Mohammad Jaidur Islam Sar to conduct the first part of the session. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shihab. And thank you, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, and Pro Vice Chancellor, sir, uh, for their speech and for that time also. So now, actually, our uh, today our session two. Uh, the first session was held in 28 uh, July. Now our two distinguished uh, professor would like to give their presentation. So first, a presentation I would like to invite Dr. Muhammad Ali Muni, a research fellow and co-joint lecturer of University of Southwest. So before that, I would like to give uh, a brief. Uh, about uh, Dr. Ali Moni. Dr. Mahmoud Ali Moni is a senior researcher and co joint lecturer, UNSW Digital Health, who Center for eHealth, Faculty of Medicine, the University of South Wales, Sydney, Australia. He is a research fellow in the Cancer Research Network of Faculty of Medicine in Sydney University and Bourne Division in Garvan Institute of Medical Research. He is also a visiting research fellow in the University of Cambridge and assistant professor in the Pabna University of Science and Technology. He did his PhD in clinical bioinformatics from University of Cambridge. He published uh, more than 30 articles and book chapters. His research interest is cancer and bone genetics, disease uh, comorbidities, uh, disome, co-infection and cancer, data science, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. So I think uh, the next 30 minutes, uh, we can enjoy uh, the space from Dr. Mahmoud Alimoni. So uh, please enjoy the session. So I would like to invite Dr. Mahmoud Alimoni to give his lecture, please. Thank you, Professor Jahidul Islam and the uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Sir, Sir and also Professor Shehabuddin. Uh, so today I'm going to, so at first I'm sharing my screen. I think, I think I need permission from you to share. Maybe I'm not co-host now. Dr. Aminur, please make him co-host. Dr. Aminur. Co-host for the Okay, so maybe. Okay, sorry, I'm sharing now. Okay, so can you see my slide? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, so today I'm going to explain the, uh, some brief idea about the bioinformatic because it is the new field uh, for some people and uh, also some big data, how we can use this bioinformatics and big data to um, help to for this COVID-19 pandemic situation. So actually what is bioinformatics? Bioinformatics actually combined field. It is a multidisciplinary field of science and it's combined of engineering, biology, statistics, medicine, computer science. And the bioinformatics is really important because they, 
use like computational knowledge and collect data from different disease related also uh, big data and then it is they uh, we uh, like the bioinformatics people interpret those data using different technology develop software develop method, uh, method model algorithm to interpret those data and also to predict or identify some drug that could be useful from the existing drug for the new disease now we are waiting for the vaccine of covid-19 or the any drug that could be useful for covid-19 patient but how we can get those drug or vaccine who will develop or this drug and who can give the idea or information to generate this drug this bioinformatics is really important to uh, develop this drug because to develop the drug we need in details of different things from virus to human and we need a lot of information interpretation which is not easy task or not a small tiny task so how we can like the bioinformatics can help in this case so the virus is infected human and so for this reason we need to know the virus mechanism for development the vaccine or drug or to prevent this one also we need to know the infection mechanism how it is infected the human in which organ how much affecting in which organ and also the effect after the infections and also we need to know the process of drug development considering all the information of virus and the human body so it is not easy task it's not a tiny task and it's not a small data it's a very big data big information and now it is possible to develop the drug but we have a lot of information but the information is changing continuously that is the problem so for example i am starting to talk on about the virus the sars virus how do we know or how, how do we know this is a corona virus so we know this on from the dna or the whole dna sequencing of this virus although it is very small 26 to 32 kilobase in length 32 kilobase means 32000 bits bits means if we see here the is bit means on later here so it's a computation when you say the bits it's like a computational things so to understand the virus okay it is a corona virus why it is not the old corona virus so uh, after sequencing this one we get the sequence of what the sequence of this letter like a letter and from this letter we need to understand it is a corona virus or any other virus so based on this sequencing we are now uh, sure that it is a new corona virus because this sequence is similar to the old corona virus corona virus covid on but some difference than the old corona virus also we like the people compared with the old like other virus or any other parasite or in, uh, anything and then found that no it is different than those but mostly similar to the old corona virus and little bit similar to the mars but it is not a small task it's uh, like the general people it, we cannot do manually this one we need some sophisticated tool we need to develop some algorithm we need to use those algorithm or even machine learning or deep learning model to compare this um, sequence to identify the similarity dissimilarity uh, and to identify what is the difference with the previous virus so the bioinformatics like people who is like the many researchers they develop some algorithm model to identify uh, model and tools to identify these difference and the uh, alignment approach on the other hand we know the evolution so for example we know there is a, there was a, um, another there was another pandemic which like the, its name was uh, spanish flu but actually the it was not the uh, generated from the like originated from the spain it was originated from the china but how did i did, do we know about it was originated from china from this virus sequence for example here if we uh, make the sequence of the virus in different time points 
and if we compare each other, we can find out which virus came at first because the virus always changes its structure, like coronavirus, it is happening. It is uh, like changing its structure, like the, it is, the mutation is happening. So that is the reason it is very hard to make the drug because it is always changing its uh, uh, pattern. So for, the, for this season, the using the bioinformatic software tools or still now people are developing some algorithm to compare different strains like the some strains already sequenced in Bangladesh uh, recently, maybe in, till now, maybe 20 to 30 and other country, they have already uh, sequenced many strains. So uh, comparing those, like the companies, all these strains, we can find out why it was originated. Actually, it was originated from China, and but we know, but actually it could be originated from another country, but no, actually it is originated from China based on this sequence. So from this evolutionary things, we understand that where, from where it is originated, how it is moving from one country to another country. Like in Bangladesh, from where it came, the virus came, it came from Europe or it came from USA or China. We, we know that one because based on this sequencing of those virus, we are, can understand from where it came to Bangladesh. So for this one, we need a lot of computational things, computational power, like the cluster, which is, we call the supercomputer things. So analyze those data, also the some sophisticated tool using the like uh, cluster. But on the other hand, I told that the virus uh, genome sequence is like 32 kilo base, but on the other hand, human genome, that is called DNA. We always heard the DNA, DNA sequencing for, which is using for different purposes. Nowadays, we can identify many things using the DNA sequence. So, but this DNA sequence is actually combined. When we do the sequence, it is combined of a lot of letters, like TCGA, these four letters. But this, from this four letter, we need to understand the patterns. But human, even uh, there is no similar, like exact similarity between two men, even both are healthy. But in the case of COVID infected people, if we compare with the healthy people, then we'll get some difference. So we need to identify those. But on the other hand, different COVID in, like coronavirus infected people are, uh, will show different patterns. So it is very hard to compare and to find out, are they really, uh, based on DNA sequence, are they really uh, infected in which level or infected by which strain? So, why it is complex? Like, if we consider any tissue or even if we say in simply, from one drop of blood, and from one drop of blood, if we take one drop of blood and if we do the sequence using the name generation sequencing machine, we can get 30 GB data. From one drop of blood, it has 30 GB data because in your DNA, DNA, everything is written what you are doing in every day. If you do something wrong, it is written in your DNA. If you smoke, it is written in your DNA. If you are giving some bribe to the people, it is written in your DNA. So there is no way uh, you can hide anything from your DNA. So from one drop of blood, it is making 30 GB data and we know that from human genome, human DNA, that is the three billion base pairs, like the three billion base bits, like on bit A, T, C, G, A, like three billion. So it is not easy for a clinician or doctor or even anybody can understand from this sequence pattern. It is very hard. So from on sample, 300 GB data, which we cannot analyze those data using our simple computer, personal computer. So for this one, we did use some um, high configuration like cluster, supercomputer things, and also some computer, uh, like computational power, like also algorithm to analyze this data. And this can be, this is doing by the people of bioinformatics research people are doing analyzing this data. And not only the analyzing this data, interpreting this data to the doctor, to the everybody, okay, what is happening, what is showing this data. So that 
why this is why this is the reason the bioinformatics is very important field nowadays for health sector also others as well as other sectors and like before going to the next slide i would like to explain a little bit about the central dogma when covid 19 like sars cov 2 actually sars cov 2 is a virus and covid 19 is actually the patient so when sars cov 2 infect like uh, in fact, interact with the human, then actually it is happening in protein level, not the DNA level. So what is happening? So DNA, what is DNA? We know the DNA. I explained a little bit about it. And after the transcription, it is happening RNA. Like if I say something, if I would like to uh, uh, do something, then it is like the DNA gives some message through the RNA. So it is like the RNA. And after the RNA, when it happened, then it is like protein. So it is that after the transcription and translation, it is becoming the protein. So the in COVID infection, coronavirus infection, it is interacting with the human in protein level. So there are a lot of data nowadays producing for the drug identification, drug development, vaccine development. And that is trying to develop based on different kinds of data, whole genome sequencing data, RNA sequencing data, chip sequencing data, and how it is producing. It is producing um, from the virus interaction with the human, infected people, how it is changing, how it is affecting. And these data we can analyze using different algorithm. We are developing different algorithm. We can analyze different ways and we can uh, like there are did many things, copy number variation uh, and uh, mutation, gene expression, gene fusion, many kinds of data. So these data need to analyze for all these categories of uh, prediction, identification, uh, like drug prediction, or to use the existing drug, drug for the, any new disease. And, but uh, another point is like, okay, so COVID, 19 infected people if we see different people are different so it is not easy to understand these things so that is the make reason it is making delay to develop some drug or vaccine because the virus is changing its structure also when the human is infected then it is making different um, type of problem for different people not in similar way so all these things we need can analyze using the bioinformatics tools and bioinformaticians can do the analyze analyzing those data recently so based on the actually prediction model it is not based on the real model the real data so from on team from the usa they found that okay from the clinical perspective there are different diseases patient with different diseases they suffer uh, more uh, their severity is more compared to the healthy people. So they found that actually the genetic patterns are different of those patients compared to the healthy people. That is the reason the severity is not similar for all people who are infected by COVID-19 infection. But it is not based on the real data. So they assumed based on, compared, uh, based on the, their computational model and modeling. Of, and, but in the back end, they use the, all the disease data uh, genetic data of, of different diseases. Based on this idea, we have started to do the research. Some of our research paper already published. Uh, now we are writing almost uh, like writing and submitting almost 20 uh, journal articles and some are under review. And in our team, there are some people from the uh, Green University, uh, including Owen Kobe Rana. He is also um, working with our team. Also, Professor <coughs> Zaidul Islam, he's also, he has also a group of team members. He is also collaborating with our uh, team and with me also to work on this coronavirus um, infection research work. So some of our, I'm presenting some of our work that we have submitted and some are published uh, recently on the, this COVID-19 infection related work. 
So, for example, in this work, we have tried to find out the genetic pattern of the infected people compared to the healthy people. So, why it is important? If we understand that, and then we can identify the drug target. So, drug target means, like, for example, some genetic marker. And using those genetic marker, then another group, they can develop some vaccine or drug. So, this is the approach for developing the drug. So, in this case, at first, we have compared our new COVID-19 infection, uh, like the virus sequence, with the other virus sequence. Like other virus means including SARS, MARS, which is similar to the, uh, like it is there also coronavirus, but also the influenza, we have considered those uh, to compare with the new coronavirus. And we found that actually it is similar to the old coronavirus, but there are some difference. But one new thing, but I'm explaining it a bit early, but one very interesting thing, we found that in new coronavirus, there are something which is little bit strange. Like we found there are something like HIV-1, strain of HIV-1 is included in the new coronavirus. Also the parasite, like the malaria, some part of that one is included there, which is little bit really strange. It is not the as usual things for the any virus. So, but it is different things. So in this case, we have considered the healthy people information like the transcriptomic data, gene expression data, also the COVID-19 infected patient data. So those samples are actually the lung epithelial cells related because when the virus infect to the people, then actually it attack to the lung mainly. It is respiratory disease, it makes respiratory problems. So then after finding those drug target, we found like 108 genes that are really significant. And based on that, actually people are thinking, not out from our study, maybe other people also found similar things. The prior people are thinking to develop the drug. So now we found the 108 drug target, but we need a lot of validation things. We have done some bioinformatics examples. We have applied like the Fisher exact test, hypergeometric test, to find out that are they randomly coming in our analysis or they are really important for the COVID-19 infection. In this case, we need a lot of data. Maybe this sample, like here we have used like six samples and for generating these six samples, we need like over $1 million. So this is on uh, study. Actually, we have submitted this on, like it is under review in science journal. And second work, actually it is running by Humayun Kobir Rana of uh, Green University. He is the um, leading author of this work. Uh, he is looking, okay, is e smoking is a risk factor for COVID-19. So we have developed this project. Actually still it is under the development. Uh, we will submit soon this paper. I hope we will submit in top right journal. And in this case, we found that, okay, for smoking, actually it is making some problem to the people, like it is affecting to the lung and it is changing some genetic pattern of the, lung, of the human lung. When the hearts infected, like the, if one is smoke, uh, is, uh, who is smoke, if he infected by the COVID-19 and another healthy people infected by the COVID-19, the genetic pattern of these two patients is different. And in this case, the problem, the severity problem of the smoker may suffer more than the healthy people. Like healthy means like who is not actually smoker. So in this case, we try to find out, okay, if some smoker is infected by the COVID-19, maybe he or she needs a different type of drugs compared to the usual people. So that is the reason we are trying to develop, we try to develop this model. In this model, similar, we have tried to find out what is the shared genes uh, for the like synergi synergistic genes that is making, that is shared between the COVID-19 infection and also the smoking. And then we try to find out the pathway and drug target and the validation things, function analysis using different sources of data. So another interesting thing that is like uh, we are we are well, actually we have submitted to the World um, Psychiatric Journal. Its impact factor is over 40. 
uh, it's uh, like actually we found that uh, psychiatric disorder patients they suffer more if they infected by the COVID-19 like SARS-CoV-2 and especially we consider we found that bipolar schizophrenia and post-traumatic uh, stress disorder people they suffer more psychiatric, psychiatric problem and they face severity for this infection so in this study we have tried to find out who is genetic mutation or who is genetic pattern is changing or making more influence for these infections so i'm going quickly so on paper is in our like uh, also uh, human covid rana is also involved in this project uh, it is in the final revision we have submitted the final revision hope it will be came out within come out within uh, on a two weeks so in this case we have before coming to the real data of coronavirus infected which like in a couple of months before then we try to find out okay the new virus is already in so what is the uh, what is the uh, like genetic pattern which genetic pattern could be of the new virus before identifying the new like the new virus data then we did this work and so it is almost going to uh, came out, come out the publication so in this case we have tried to compare all like different type of uh, virus genetic pattern and that is we made the phylogenetic tree and we have also uh, identified the gene expression like identified the biomarker which are common and similar way to find out the comorbidity which disease could be uh, like which disease patient could be affected more for the new coronavirus and also we propose some chemical uh, to develop the drug considering those chemical like the, the it is called drug compound or drug model which could be useful for uh, the least novel uh, coronavirus so this is the like actually i'm um, uh, this is the uh, this type of work we are doing for the COVID-19 uh, uh, project related to the bioinformatics work. We are also doing some different like machine learning and big data um, projects. And this big data and machine learning project actually considering the clinical data, symptom data, uh, blood pathology, uh, like blood test data. So on like on a power paper is under the review. Uh, in this case, like after ETL mainly, and in this case, actually, it is first review. We found that there are some symptoms that could be um, that could be important uh, for the COVID-19 infection patient. So, and it could be useful for the early detection. Early detection, like if we feel some fever, it doesn't mean you are infected by the COVID-19. So, have fever, cough, uh, fatigue, and uh, many other things. Uh, like in total, maybe eight, nine. Those symptoms are important for the COVID-19 infection. And considering those, actually we developed some algorithm, like machine learning algorithm, to identify which symptoms are really uh, useful for early prediction. So similarly, we also consider the disease, like the patient who has the hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, how much they are affecting by the uh, COVID-19. Uh, for example, they are infected by the COVID-19, but it could be make more severity who has this type of disease so uh, that is the reason the severity of the uh, covid 19 infection is different uh, for different people some people are already dying because they have already existing some problem like the maybe the hypertension or diabetics or those type of problem so they are not managing those uh, hypertension or diabetics during this infection that is making more severity and more problem uh, for this infection so in this case our own paper already published in expert systems with application it is um, like ahmad and like our team with money so we published like it was we have started this work in early like when we found that like china declared that there is covid 19 infection is started like at that time we have started this work and for this reason we did not find uh, huge data so we have started to consider the chinese raw data sets and in our team we have there are also uh, some chinese collaborators they translated those in english 
uh, language because we don't understand the Chinese language. And using those data, we have developed some machine learning model to find out the uh, symptoms that could give us the early diagnosis. So without the real diagnosis using the PCR. So in this case, our model, uh, like using this model, we predicted combined of some symptoms, not only single symptoms or uh, we have sorted out which symptoms gives the more priority which like pneumonia which is really important could be maybe useful uh, for the preliminary diagnosis right, or preliminary prediction that he is suffering the COVID-19 infection so yeah so if you are interested you can look at this paper in details so and other papers like uh, using the machine learning we have submitted to the some journals so uh, now like before we had only the very small data from the Chinese raw data sets. Now we have large data sets related to the symptoms, symptoms, comorbidities, and severity death, like who went to the um, ICU, who already like uh, recovered, and also the death patient information, and different symptoms information, comorbidities information. Because these are important. If we understand that these symptoms he has, he's suffering with pneumonia or ARDS uh, or combined of those, then it is very um, like we are confirmed that he's suffering the COVID-19 infection. Uh, but if we see that some people are suffering like different type of symptoms, then maybe he's not suffering the COVID-19. This is our actually the second paper compared to the previous paper. So. In this case, we use like over 500k uh, patient information, but uh, it was uh, very hard to um, like uh, collect those data and also um, uh, to filter those data. Uh, it was very hard. And after filtering, we got only maybe a couple of thousand data, uh, which are really useful for our model. And in this case, also we have considered the disease information, which diseases are really risky, like hypertension. Yeah. We that these are really uh, risky for the hypertension people uh, who has this problem. Also, second cases is diabetics or kidney disease, cardiovascular problem, COPD, asthma. Those people should take more care and the government should give more priority to the, these people and they should uh, like, uh, we need to give more priority to these people because uh, the severity of these people is more than compared to the general people who does not have this type of problem. So actually in this case, we look, okay, what is the like, there are symptom and hypertension. We found that the dead people, the dead patient, number of dead patient, if we compare the pneumonia and hypertension, who has the hypertension and he's suffering the pneumonia, Pneumonia is a symptom, and most of the cases we found that uh, it was very hard to uh, recover from this COVID-19 infection. So in this case, our machine learning gives the idea that combined of hypertension, uh, combined of disease, like existing disease, and also the current symptoms, uh, which are mo more important, which gives more severity. Why these are important? In case of distribution of the ICU, if in our country we have like 10,000 ICU, a bit, then if now the problem may arise like uh, more than 500k patient, then who should give the um, more priority for the ICU bed? In this case, like pneumonia and hypertension, who has the hypertension problem? And he's suffering, uh, he has the pro symptom of pneumonia. He's, he could maybe the more severity in this case. So I'm going to finish. Actually, which type of research we are doing and uh, which type of uh, plan do we have uh, to make some collaboration even we can do some collaboration with the Guinea University Bangladesh so we are doing the early detection so early warning so like similar to the smoke signals in case of smoke signals so we know that if the smoke signal uh, we get in early signal before fire like a fire alarm so we can make some type of device uh, if you have some idea we can make, we can develop some device which can be useful to give the early warning us. And also for diagnosis, uh, we are using some CT scan image. Uh, also there's some clinical information like pathology test. Using the pathology test, uh, we can predict, uh, we can predict 
the patient and we can diagnose the patient using without using the uh, pcr testing also the case of prediction case like prevention we can use some prevention approach like uh, calculating the probability of infection uh, also the uh, information we are develop we are using like we are developing one model like using the information from the twitter so the news and twitter so we can uh, I, uh, we can understand the mentality of the people mentality of the patient also we can predict the uh, mental situation of the or psychiatric situation of the infected people so also some people are doing the uh, like robot system to uh, make the distance with from the patient uh, also some automation like chatbot so to get the uh, support from the people or like the uh, from the doctor or some automation automated doctor like the ai doctor to get some support related to the uh, infect, related to the infection or related to the drug or related to the any support uh, from this ai system and also we can monitoring the, we are not doing this work uh, this type of work but maybe some people are doing the monitoring system like using gps satellite system and media data so thank you very much so if you have some question i'm happy to give you the answer uh, thank you dr muni for your nice presentation very nice especially when i got information that is one drop that makes 300 gb data it's, a, it's amazing anyway so any questions from the audience please raise your hand assalamu alaikum can i ask a question yes sir yes sir, yes, sir. And now uh, uh, it's a nice informative presentation but can i uh, uh, ask a simple uh, question that when a yeah, the covid 19 changes its structure what do you mean by that and how do you identify that its structure is changing so actually i mean that it is uh, happening the mutation yeah so when it is like continuously the mutation is happening so like the you know i told you that there are 32 uh, kilo base of the uh, maybe 20 to 32 kilo base of the sequence of the uh, sars cov 2 virus but if it is uh, like continuously the mutation is happening what is the mutation sending the maybe i don't know like the biologist they know more than me they are like they understand better so maybe on bt is changing for each mutation like uh, maybe t is changing the c or g is changing the u so this is happening in the mutation so for this it is changing continuously because it is mutated the on bit is changing with another bit like on later is changing with another bit later so the sequence is, is so that is the reason the structure is changing is it really structure of the air virus or its impacts now it's not impact it's i'm talking about the sequence pattern so the 32 kilo base so among them the mutation is happening so on bit is changing to another bit so like a is changing c or u changing t in this way it is the mutation is happening and so what is the mutation mutation is like the new bit is coming inside or sending on bit with another yeah uh, okay uh, professor kamal maybe you got your answer right sir no uh, well uh, okay uh, actually i wanted to know is it j the virus is changing its structure or its characteristic. So maybe this from data point of view, uh, I'm not uh, sure that this, this is the right answer or no. No, no, I'm, I'm talking that changing is sequence. Yeah. So in sequence, it is happening the mutation. So for this mutation, it is changing not the characteristics. If you change the structure, that means it is also changing the characteristics. If uh, like uh, if I am uh, suffering some disease, my DNA sequence will be changes. That means the sequence of my DNA will change to.
to uh, maybe uh, for this infection or for some diseases. So how it is happening? It is happening for the mutation or sending some part or the copy number variation, insertion, deletion. Uh, that is continuously happening with the human body. Similar to the in virus, it is happening the mutation because virus uh, DNA sequence length is smaller than the human. It is very small, 32 kilobits. Uh, so in this case, it is mutation happening for different kind of environmental cases. How I, this virus is coming to us? Uh, it is coming to us, although it is the biological question, biological things. I'm explaining those things in a, with my little knowledge. So why it is coming to us? Uh, maybe this virus uh, uh, maybe originated in a couple of hundred years before. I don't know. Maybe or it is coming from the bat. And in case of bat, it did not work. Uh, it, it did not make any problem to the bat, but it is making problem us. And in, when, because when it, is, it was in bat, maybe its uh, gen uh, genetic pattern was similar, but it does not make any problem to the bat. There are many kinds of virus who is, uh, that do not make any problem to the bat, but it comes to us and it will make problem. But I did not know this one before. Uh, yeah, so it is not good to eat some mangoes uh, that is, uh, that was eaten by the, that is eaten by like bat or something. So that is the reason it's just continuously, continuously changing the mutation. That is the reason uh, if, it's, if we see uh, that one, Like, yeah. So in this case, if you see that this is based on the sequence, which sequence, if you see the picture, uh, this image, uh, this is based on the sequence. And in this case sequence, and some mutation is happening. So continuously changing its sequence. And that is making actually its structure. And, uh, and if, it change, if its sequence changes, then uh, it also changes its characteristics. Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Moni. Sir, maybe you have got your answer point because maybe uh, I understand that the characteristics and uh, and the structure of the virus may be same. If change characteristics, then change that means the structure also be changed, right? Yeah. So yeah. So if like it is actually basically it is changing. It's it is happening the mutation, and it when it is mutated, mutation. then it is changing the we are talking the we are telling its structure. And then it, if it is mutated, then the characteristics will be different than the previous one. Right, right, right. Okay, thank you, sir. sir and uh, then, uh, okay, can next. I ask you a question, sir? Uh, if you uh, allow. Sure. Uh, uh, okay. So thank you for your presentation and um, also um, um, give me a chance to attend this seminar. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, thank you again. Sir, uh, what type of uh, machine, learn, uh, machine learning uh, algorithm you used uh, for predicting the severity uh, based on symptoms and uh, commodities? Um, uh, SGM, so, MNB, CNN, or uh, any other algorithm? No, no, we did not apply the CNN because for the limitation of data. So we applied different type of uh, different type of predicting model. So not only single. Yeah. So many uh, kinds of. So for example, all uh, actual, some of some of this uh, algorithm so like including the decision from the decision tree and also uh, like can in all, all kind of including the prediction because we use also classification we use also prediction so all available models because we don't we don't know which one is doing better if you are interested like if you see um, the paper like uh, expert based system. applications uh, yeah, Donald. so the details is given there. Uh, the details is given there based on the which model worked better and which model uh, performed better compared to the others. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, then I would like to invite MD Shuriful Alum for your questions. MD Shuriful Alum. Thank you, Dr. Moni, for your nice presentation. Uh, I have a, a very simple question. I'm not based uh, expert based on your field uh, my question is um, what kind of data you need to develop a drug for specific disease for drug development yes uh, what kind of data need to drug development for specific disease so actually there are many steps yeah but we do in the middle stage, like in the first stage, the biologists, they generate the data. 
from the maybe from the species or from the virus from the human host but in the middle stage we do only the analysis of the data so we analyze data in from the different sources different types of data including the transcriptomic data like for example i mentioned the blood or in this case we can consider the lung tissue or even we consider the dna sequence of the virus okay so it's so we good. analyze all kind of data okay. using yeah. different methods and yeah. So, but for the drug development, we can use like, for example, we have different methods of analyzing the data and different type of data. So all these are sequencing data. Considering all this data, then people, the next step is like considering the changes of okay, or okay, the okay, drug target, okay, but, then they identify but, that drug. But uh, Dr. Moni, specifically, I would like to know the, what kind of data from the drug side you disease side so, is okay suppose you you have a virus rna data cell data infected cell data or a healthy cell data but what kind of drug data you need to correlate it with this disease so there are actual like in our perspective we use the drug compound data base so uh, we use the uh, approved drug model that could be useful for uh, corresponding to the drug target, we use those drug model and predict that which drug model can be useful for the target. Here the target is for RNA sequencing data, we make the target like the gene, maybe uh, any gene, BRCA1 for example. If we find that BRCA1 is a, uh, our differentially expressed genes in my analysis, then we try to find out that okay, the BRCA1 may be interact with some drug compound. So the bioinformatics, they do not do the real things in the wet lab. So we just predict that we make the list of the drug compound which could be useful for that drug target. For example, we generate the 10 drug target list and that may be, it is may, may be useful for that drug target or for, that means for that disease. Then considering those drug target, then the, maybe the pharmaceutical companies or any other research lab, they consider those 10 drug target. And then they make the experiment in wet lab, apply some drug on that, on similar type of experiment, and then look that what is changing, what is making the problem. So initially may them do the in vitro model, then they do the vivo model like the mice model or any kind of animal model. Then they go to for the uh, stage two or stage three of clinical trial. Like uh, they try to apply to the human. And in finally, they can, if it is success, then yeah. For each step, they should be successful to go in the next step. So there are four or five steps. So, but we do only, we just propose that this drug compound, this drug model could be useful for this drug target. Drug target is that is identified from the analyzing of the data that we got from the like from the sequencing or any kind of transcriptomic or study. And this where we found this drug model. This is the drug model, FDA approved drug model that is allowed to use for some diseases. But these are the existing drug model. But we are looking, okay, combined of these two, three drug model could be useful for the new disease. But it is maybe it could be then the people test it and if it is successful successful otherwise they try to tune those drug model with other things and then they think that okay maybe it is useful. but there are another another part i but i do not work on the computational drug design that is the computational drug design not the bioinformatics part then they consider those mutation things and the drug model then they run in different ways to find out that which model, which uh, drug compound can bind in the protein level or in different ways. And then also they finish their part and then it goes to the wet lab. So it's in different, uh, long steps. Okay, thank you, Dr. Moni and Dr. Fripulalum. Actually, uh, because of our time limitations, they're unable to take uh, many more questions. So I just take one last question from Tala Tausif. Please, in briefly, just ask your questions. Tala Tausif. Hello, Tala Sausip. Maybe you're on. Maybe you muted. Okay.
professor Zahid, we cannot hear him. I think uh, we can uh, uh, go for the second presentation. Already we have uh, passed much time. Sorry, I did not hear Talha Tawsif, maybe. He's mute. Professor Zahid, can you hear us? Uh, Dr. Shihab, I think he is facing some a network problem. So uh, it's better but, to go for the next one. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moni, for your very nice presentation. Now we're going to move to the next, uh, part, like the next part of our. the encounter. Mm. He participated in reputed national and international conferences, technical program committees, and academic networks. Recently, he guest edited a special theme issued in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, a harmonizing energy autonomous computing and computational intelligence. And I would, I'm also very much honored to actually welcome him because he had been a mentor for me for many, many times and for many other IUTNs. So, sir, please uh, take the floor and, uh, and yeah, that's it. Thank you, sir. Uh, just uh, uh, one minute. I just, you know, cut out from the network. Okay, I'm sorry. So, so thank you, Dr. Moni. I will talk with you later and thank you, Green University. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Thank you, Shihab. Okay, you, can you can you all hear me? I've got a very unstable internet connection. I just want to make sure that you can all hear me. No, no. It's uh, I think it's very it's yes, great. Yes, we can. We can. Good. So um, it's a pleasure uh, coming back to Shihab, uh, Rajag Bhai, Motaharul, and some of the other known faces, and also an extra privilege to know. Uh, to share the stage with someone I know for a long time. Muhammad Ali Moni happens to be a good friend of mine. And we have uh, some fond memories together uh, back in Cambridge when uh, you know we had uh, times together over there. So uh, my talk is, um, if you look at it uh, carefully, it's not directly relevant to really COVID-19, but uh, you will see that uh, this is the tool that you'll be using for uh, you know doing many things, including uh, you know identification, detection, or even uh, prediction of many conditions. Uh, so uh, as as a, as a uh, as an academic, I actually design chips, microchips, circuits, and systems, and uh, that is where my strength is. I don't really go into sp uh, 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 any application-specific circuits or systems, but you will see that when I talk about uh, the AI uh, circuits and systems, I will, I'll be referring to some examples uh, as and when possible. Um, so I'll be doing something daring today, which is uh, I'll be going through very basics of artificial intelligence. Uh, when I say very basics, I'll go back to the roots of why uh, we have artificial intelligence in the first place. I'll try, and I'll try and define it. And then once I have got the platform ready, I'll talk about some of the researches that uh, we had been doing here at uh, Newcastle University. Uh, I've been privileged uh, since I joined uh, Newcastle uh, in 2015. I've been privileged to have a team uh, which has about uh, altogether about 17 members, 17 PhD students and uh, about uh, five uh, research assistants and also some uh, funding from different uh, you know, agencies. So I'm pretty sure that um, uh, well, I'm, there are a lot of youngsters who will be uh, you know, very active on social media. And um, what you do not know is that you are being tractioned continuously. You are being profiled continuously. You're, you're, being, uh, you're, being, you're being put as a data into, a, into an AI system continuously because the, the social media wants to know you better it wants to know you and your behavior. It wants to know what sort of things you like, what sort of things you do not like, so that it can provide you the uh, correct information at the correct time. Uh, this is what they uh, rely on. This is what their business model is really established on. So this is not something that uh, you know uh, that that has been around for some time. 
Um, another thing, if you're really looking for something on Google, uh, you are trying to search something and then, you know, magically, uh, Google already knows half the keywords that you're trying to search for. Amazing, isn't it? But it's actually, again, behind the scenes, someone is profiling you. Uh, it's actually getting to know you better. If you're a researcher, it's very likely that you'll be looking for something which is a research term. Or if you're a hairstyle designer, you'll be looking for something which, which is relevant to, let's say, uh, the hairstyle and so on. And if you're watching movies, you often have uh, very correct suggestions from Netflix, for example. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're a fan of action movies, you'll probably see uh, uh, Netflix suggesting you some action movies and so on. And of course, if you use uh, your uh, personal smartphones, uh, you'll also have your personal assistants, uh, which are uh, capable of understanding your voice, uh, understanding what sort of keywords you look for, and all of these things. So if you look at it really carefully, um, the, 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 the buzzword, artificial intelligence is already happen happening, right? Uh, question is, um, if it is already happening, and, and if it is already mature, why are we uh, going, uh, going about designing new AI circuits and systems in the first place? And my take on that is that, honestly speaking, we are at the very infancy of artificial intelligence. I'll, I'll tell you why as I, as I move on. Uh, the biggest challenges are not yet solved, but we have started using, which is good, but uh, in order to make AI uh, pervasive and also ubiquitous, we need to do a lot more research uh, in, the, in the days ahead. Right. Um, I often see that uh, people uh, confuse between the terms like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, you have regression learning, reinforcement learning, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, many, many terminologies are, are, are out there. But what is really AI? What is ML? Is there any connection between these two? Are they the same thing? Um, is there any way we can differentiate between them? So when I go on to speak to my uh, students, the, the first point I make is that uh, AI is basically an umbrella discipline. It's an overarching discipline. It has many, many sub-disciplines under, under it. And machine learning algorithms or uh, the different types of algorithms are manifestations of uh, designing artificial intelligence would be one of them. Data science. Uh, I suppose uh, if, I, uh, if I look at it really carefully, someone like uh, Muhammad Ali Moni is basically a bioinformatic data scientist. What he does is that he looks at a vast, major, uh, in a vast volume of data and he creates information out of them. So this is another, uh, uh, another, another branch which is really important for uh, the, uh, fostering the growth of machine learning in general. There is also another community which is, uh, which is uh, aligned to me who design hardware and software systems and make them energy efficient to make sure that they can create new powerful applications. And there's also another community which is uh, basically looking at modeling and verification. Uh, if you're designing uh, an AI, you need to make sure that AI is responsible. Uh, it, it can give you information exactly the way you want it. Uh, it can, you can verify the, uh, for certain properties and so on. So that's, that community looks into modeling and verification of AI. Now, Machine learning, data science, hardware, software, modeling and verification, all of these things make up a buzzword, a really uh, overarching keyword called artificial intelligence. But what is really artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence, as I put it, is a way of engineering. It's not a natural phenomenon, obviously. It's something that you have to engineer. Engineering a system with intelligence that could have intelligence at any level. For example, subhuman, which is uh, less than the human intelligence, or it could be even superhuman. If your um, if your uh, capability of uh, doing the uh, machine learning or uh, machine learning is at the level of let's say uh, uh, you know uh, several human beings uh, performs at the same time, then you can as well design something at the superhuman level. So I hope the 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 confusion will have uh, gone right now. AI is the umbrella keyword. ML is simply just just a manifestation of many algorithms, and you can design using those MLs. You can design hardware and software systems. Now when I go about talking about uh, uh, the modern day uh, uh, machine learning, I, I always start with this uh, notion. If you, um, if you have heard about, I'm sure some of you will have heard about something called uh, linear regression. Now, although the modern day ML has really progressed uh, to the level of, let's say, very sophisticated neural networks, but actually behind the scenes, what we're doing is linear regression. Why? Look at this. Uh, so in, in linear regression, what we do is we have an independent variable, yeah? A variable that does not necessarily depend on uh, the other variables. So we throw different uh, values of that independent variable 
And what we do is we observe the impact of that variable on another variable, which is the dependent variable, let's say y. Now, what we do then is that uh, we try and model the behavior of the dependent variable in relation to the independent variable. Now, because it is a linear regression, the term, as, as it says, what we do here is that we try and linearize the relationship between x and y. Now, obviously, the actual y's will be different, but your linearized version of, uh, of, the, of the relationship will not be y anymore. It's basically y prime. Now, y prime, what you want is that you want to make sure that y prime is as close as possible to, to the actual y. So in order to make sure that that is possible, what you do is you uh, start designing, um, let's say, with the initial hypothesis of, uh, let's say, your y prime, you start, start designing the uh, B matrix, which satisfies your relationship or, or which satisfies the very fact that your error is the minimal uh, possible uh, to make sure that you have the right kind of predictability between y and y prime. Okay. Now, in steps, you have uh, you, you take a certain learning rate, and in different steps of this learning rate, you try and design a new B value to make sure that the beta value or B value allows you to have the Y prime relationship any way you want it. Now, you can do it by using a squared error method, which is uh, basically agnostic of your signs. For example, errors can have sign. You can have uh, Y minus Y prime with a negative sign or a positive sign. It doesn't matter if you square it up will end up becoming a squared error. So it will be easier for you to actually mitigate your, uh, mitigate, mitigate your uh, uh, beta value variations. Now, what if we had here, not just one variable, one, not just one independent variable, we had multiple independent, vari uh, independent variables. Then we would have one dependent variable described by many independent variables. We would have the same expression would have looked like something like this. For example, y prime would have been beta one, x1, beta 2, x2, and possibly a beta 0. That is nothing but what we have today as, uh, as the neural, uh, neural network. Although biologically inspired by the uh, principle of, let's say, how neurons work, uh, originally proposed by uh, Rosenblatt in 1958, but this is how it works. You have, for example, a very simple neural network here. You have uh, two uh, in input variables, independent variables, I call it. You multiply them with uh, some weights. These are basically W1 and W2 each. And then you accumulate them with some bias called B. Then you have a hypothesis, which looks like this. You have Y prime, which is the one that you're modeling. And the Y is the one that you want to model. Um, so the Y prime is basically a multiplication, weighted multiplication of X with the weights. And then you have the, the bias added to it. Now, can you see this expression is nothing but something that we have seen in the linear regression? But why linear uh, neural network is so powerful as opposed to uh, linear regression? You'll come back to we'll come back to that in, in a moment. So what happens here is that uh, now that you have a problem like this, you do the exact same exercise like you like you did for the linear regression. You find the best possible W1 and W2 values uh, and also the B values that will satisfy your minimum error squared error needs for between the y prime and y that is exactly the kind of hypothesis now if i keep on doing that obviously if i do do it with, at a certain learning rate and if i iterate the uh, the update of the weights uh, where, you know steps up to steps it will come back to a value a set of values of y, uh, w that will allow me to have that kind of set, you know that kind of um, uh, hypothesis to be satisfied now this is obviously the simplest possible neural network you can think of where I don't have any complexity. Everything happens in, in a direct shot. I have input uh, variables, I've got an output variable, I've got nothing uh, hidden inside. Uh, it's absolutely visible. Uh, there's no, nothing at all in terms of uh, having some internal layers. But if you want to now, let's say, do a, a bit more complex uh, algorithm, uh, some, something like predicting a very uh, uh, predicting and uh, uh, predicting a variable which uh, depends on many, 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 many inputs. Now, what happens there is that because you have many, many inputs, it's possible that you can have many different possible uh, weight values as well. So, how do you provide the stochasticity, the variability, the uh, the dimensionality that it needs to in order to make sure that your your accuracy or uh, your your kind of predictability is as high enough uh, to the to the level of uh, you know your Desired, uh, desired level. Now, what you do is that you do two things, some fascinating things. Number one, 
now that you have more inputs, right? So what you could possibly do, if you just ignored the ones in the middle, what you could possibly do is you can have, uh, you know, uh, without any hidden layer, you could have all of them connected and, uh, you know, uh, connected to the output layer directly. Uh, meaning that you will have, let's say, if you have n number of inputs, you'll have n number of weights multiplied. And then, of course, because you've got uh, four different outputs generated from this one, you'll have four times n. That's how many uh, accumulators you will need. But... Uh, if you look at it, four times n is the number of uh, stochastic paths you're providing. Now, that is not good enough for a bigger problem because, as I said, uh, I started with the notion that okay, you need to make sure that you're doing a finer range of learning and you're providing the uh, correctness of the learning to the best possible level. In order to do that, you need to create more paths, more paths vertically, more paths, uh, more paths vertically, and more paths horizontally as well. So how do you do that? What we do is we make the network, the neural network, uh, deeper. By deeper, what I mean you, is that you introduce more and more hidden layers. Can you see by doing the more hidden layers, what you're doing is that you're creating lots and lots of different paths, not just four times n, four times n times m times uh, you know uh, l and and so on. The number of hidden layers. So the deeper you make, the more number of stochastic paths you have. But is that the only, only way you can make your uh, network learn better and make it more uh, sort of accurate in terms of the learning objectives that you have? There is another way. What you can do is you know, instead of having many, many uh, you know, uh, hidden layers, you can, you can actually have limit the number of hidden layers and you can make it wider. That means you make the uh, network wider, horizontally expanded. The number of neurons in each hidden layer will be much larger. Again, you do the same effect. You have the same effect, but in a different, uh, in a different cost methodology altogether. Now, this is the way the modern uh, neural network is now evolving. Obviously, this is not exact. This is the, uh, uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the 1973 uh, uh, literature, this is the kind of fully networked, uh, fully connected uh, neural network that you will see, but, but the modern uh, neural networks will have evolved in complexities and also the uh, different kind of sparsifications. What you can do over here is that you can see that uh, I've got, let's say, uh, a almost you know, a very high number of uh, uh, stochastic pathways to achieve, let's say, the summations at the output layer. And the output layer will, have, uh, be, will be some, some of many, many X's and many, many hidden layers and their uh, weighted accumulation altogether. Now, I may not need, if two paths are very similar to each other, I may not need them uh, at the same time. I may just uh, discard one of them. So I may actually, instead of having a fully connected neural network, that is everyone is connected with everyone, I can actually choose some of the paths to be disconnected because they are very uh, correlated with the other ones. Okay. Number two, I could also possibly remember this is an uh, this is one of those uh, algorithms where you have arithmetic multiplications, additions, multiplications, additions is all the way. So what you can do is uh, we all know if if you if you if you design uh, let's say computer uh, algorithms or let's say electronic circuits or even electrical circuit, it doesn't matter. We all know that multiplications are the most expensive arithmetic uh, operations that we can have in the, in the modern computing systems. So what about just tackling one problem, which is make, let's make the arithmetic simpler. Let's make the multiplications simpler so that we can make our algorithm less complex, faster, energy efficient, and eventually achieve our uh, target objectives. Now, there are many uh, targets here. One, if you have I've basically just shown you a, a simple, simple example where I have only, let's say, nine inputs. But what about you have, let's say, a high-definition video, uh, high-definition, let's say, a real-time image recognition problem, where, let's say, the number of inputs would be in the order of uh, several thousands or several hundreds of thousands. So if you have that problem, can you imagine, just uh, imagine the, what the network complexity will look like? You will need to address the energy efficiency. You cannot obviously burn infinite amount of energy. And if it is from a battery, you are again limited by the capacity of the battery. Uh, you, you cannot possibly wait forever to learn a certain artifact that you're trying to train your system for, right? And of course, you, you want to make sure that you are learning uh, the, uh, the best possible accuracy. So these are all really conflicting objectives because if I cut down something, I hurt accuracy. If I take away the arithmetic complexity, again, I hurt the accuracy. Uh, if I want to make my system really accurate, then I need to do the uh, arithmetic as well as the, 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 the number of, uh, you know, the deeper or wider kind of uh, dimensions of my neural network, bigger and better, 
right? So can you see there is a conflict? Uh, there's a conflict between these different objectives that we have right now. So how do we solve it? It's, it's not easy, especially for someone like me who designs the microchips. It's definitely not a, a, you know, a cup of tea. Now, what I've been talking about so far is really this box. Yes. Uh, this box where you have a finely crafted data and you're th throwing that into a neural network and the, your neural network is trying to solve your problem. But actually the real uh, world machine learning is a lot more complex than that. Why? Look at this. So before your actual machine learning, a good number of things actually also happen, which we often ignore, uh, you know, gracefully. Uh, so what you do is that in the real world machine learning, first thing we do is that we don't have any notion of understanding of uh, what data we will need. So what we do is we throw all the data. Okay, so that's uh, something we call as input data. And then we uh, obviously because we are throwing it into a digital system. So we, we need to uh, uh, express the input data in terms of uh, binary uh, precision. So what we do is, uh, is a process called binarization. And once we have the binarized data, you can decide for the binarization to happen in the floating space. Floating point space is basically some numbers with some mantissa and uh, exp exponents. Or it could be in a fixed point number where you don't have any mantissa, you just uh, depend on the uh, you know, raw literals, binary literals. Now, once you have the data, you fit, uh, put that into some kind of filtering process. Yeah, we all know filters. Filters are basically, if you look at the canonical structure of filters, the mechanical way of looking at the filters, you throw lots and lots of things at the input side, but at the output side, you get uh, only a tiny uh, you know, a portion of that one. The ones that are bigger than what you need will be filtered out. So what you do, do is that you create a filter where you can extract the significance of your, you, you only take the ones that you need and you discard the ones you do not need, right? It's a bit, it's exactly like filtering process. And this filtering process can happen uh, you, by using, let's say, signal processing techniques, or you could you also use the uh, uh, commonly known method called uh, convolutional neural networks as well. Convolutional neural networks are not, nothing but some kind of filters, right? So you can use uh, some neural networks right here as well for feature extraction. Remember, the objective here is that you want to reduce the dimensionality of your data. You don't want to crack lots and lots of arithmetic in this neural network with lots and lots of data because the amount of data that you will have over there will be in incredibly high. Now, imagine that you had originally thrown 100x data, but now after the feature extraction, you only have x data. So we have reduced the dimensionality by 100 times, let's say. Now we have an opportunity of rethinking how do we do the binarization because we have the, the amount of data, data that we have is a lot less, right? So we can now rethink the binarization. We can go back and binarize it again. This time we might as well decide that, okay, since we have less amount of data, let's spend less number of bits because less number of bits mean less complexity for our multipliers and possibly uh, you know, uh, less energy consumption as well. And then you have the actual neural network, which is what I just talked about, where you could, again, uh, you, can, you can use deep neural networks. Deep basically means that you have, as I said, you have many, many hidden layers. You can use wired neural networks where you have, uh, you know, instead of having many, many uh, hidden uh, layers, what you have is in each hidden layer, you have a lot more neurons, okay? You can also have convolutional neural networks where you don't necessarily have deeper or wider, but you have, what you have is something like split into multiple convolutional kernels, and then these uh, little uh, kernels, they process them independently, and they do some, some sort of polling at the output side. They pull them together to make sure that they can uh, decide uh, collectively rather than independently, okay? I'm not going to go so much into the details of the actual uh, structure of the convolutional filters because they're slightly different from the architectural perspective, but uh, uh, when, I, when I talk about the uh, comparative circuits and some of the other things that we have done, you will see that uh, there will be some references for you. Um, so, when you, uh, in the in, in machine learning process, you have got two things. Number one, you need to first train your system. This is a supervised learning space we're talking about. We, you, you need to train your neural network. And this training process is obviously a very, very, uh, you know, computationally intensive process. Why? Because uh, it's a bit like this. I have this black box and I'm going to throw a lot of data at the input side of the black box and the output side, I want a decision. I want the decision to be exactly the way I wanted, uh, you know, the, 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 the way I want my decision to be. Now, what you're doing is that basically you're taking the black box approach, meaning that uh, if you have within your black box, 
many, many parameters that you will need to optimize, you will need to do them. For example, how quickly shall I learn? How many hidden layers should I have? How uh, wide my uh, neural network should be? Should I use deep neural ne network? Should I use convolutional neural network? Should I use uh, recurrent neural network? Should I use some other uh, version of the neural network or, or, or not? So you have to make many, many of these choices together during the training time. And once you decide what, uh, what you'll be using for these things, then you actually throw the data in. You know your, uh, you know, the, because it is a supervision process, you obviously know what you want. So during the supervision process, you, you train the system to make sure that the, the weights, remember, I go back to my previous uh, couple of slides back where I talked about the fact that the moment you have learned your weights, yeah, the moment you have learned your W matrix, you have already learned. So the problem then gets uh, as, simple, as simple as finding the right set of weights that allow you to have the kind of learning that you want with the best possible accuracy. Now, for a very big problem like, for example, HD image recognition, image recognition, uh, uh, HD image, uh, targeting 100% accuracy does not make any sense. I'm telling you why, because uh, there's a lot of uh, spurious information in those kinds of um, uh, images. Um, it's possible that you, your image will have uh, unwanted artifacts as well, noise. Uh, it's possible that you'll have, uh, your feature extraction will have picked up something which is not exactly the way you want it to be. So what I'm saying is that it's not possible to have 100% entropy extracted from the original data that will allow you to have 100% accuracy. It's not possible, theoretically not possible. So what uh, machine learning engineers often do is that they live with uh, a certain expectation. If it is 90%, 95%, they live with that because they know that that's as good as it can be, right? Now, this is so far the kind of tutorial I have provided to, for you to appreciate that this is how the uh, neural network uh, community works. So one of the things my, um, in 2017, we had uh, actually a best paper uh, award nomination for this one and uh, it went to becoming one of the famous works and uh, we're really proud of it. We went back to the basics because we're circuit designers. We went back to the basics and we said, hang on, it looks like 80% of the power in a uh, modern day uh, neural network comes from multipliers alone. So let's design the, uh, the multipliers differently, specifically for the need of neural networks. Okay. Now, on the left-hand side, as you can see, this is the conventional multiplier. If you do the, you know, uh, to uh, multiplier and multiplicand, and you do bit by bit uh, multiplications, these are the product terms that you'll be generating, right? This is how you generate the product terms. Uh, the, the reason why we have aligned them from uh, right to left is because this is the significance, right? The left, the leftmost it is, the most uh, you know, the, the the more significant it is, and the rightmost it is, then least least significant it is, and so on. Problem is, for us circuit designers, we have to worry about two things. Number one, how wide your um, your uh, critical path is. Critical path is basically defined by the number of bits you will have, the maximum number of bits you will have in the longitudinal path, right? How many bits will need to be added together to to make sure that your multiplier is generating the output? That is often the single most, uh, you know, defining factor for uh, defining for, uh, you know, uh, describing your latency. Now, for for an eight by eight multiplier, as you can see, the typically the critical path depends on eight additions, eight of them all together. So what my uh, PhD student and RA Isa did is that he created something called significance-driven multiplier design, where he approximated the fact that. We will not be doing the actual uh, addition. We'll be doing an approximate addition between the, between the rows. And what we will do is instead of producing, if I go back to a little bit before, instead of producing the individual product terms, we will directly produce the partial product terms, which are approximated version of two bits each. For example, these two bits will produce this one. These two bits will, will produce this one. These two, two, two uh, bits will produce this one and so on. So these will be done by replacing Take note, replacing the exclusive R, if you, have already, if you, if you come from computer engineering or let's say uh, uh, the electronic engineering, you will know exclusive R is the very basic of uh, you know, adder circuits. If you replace the exclusive R, culprit, exclusive R by R gate, there's only one difference in that two table. In exclusive R, you have zero, zero producing zero. R gate also produces zero, zero with zero. Exclusive R, zero, 01 produces one, and the R gate, you also produce one. 
one zero produce, produces a one. The OR gate also produces as a one zero as one. The only difference is that when you have a one one, it produces exclusive OR produces a zero, but in OR gate, you produce a, a, a one as well. Now, if I replace XOR gate, which takes about, let's say, uh, 22, 22 transistors to design an XOR gate, as opposed to only six transistors for an, uh, for an OR gate, can you see the amount of reduction I can achieve and the, how much faster I can, uh, I can do, do it? First of all, I'm doing less operations. And secondly, I'm reducing the complexity of my adders or by simply replacing the XOR by OR gate. But of course, at the price of having some inaccuracy or approximation, okay? Now, we did simply that. And that gave us wings. Uh, look at this. Uh, so the critical path is now only four bits as opposed to eight bits. And the adding between these four bits is now happening in the space of OR gate, which is incredibly fast, almost uh, you know, five to six times faster uh, compared to the XOR gate. Uh, and what are the advantages? Look at this. If I used the neural network with the original configuration, no approximation whatsoever, my power would be, let's say, P. But if I use progressively higher and higher approximation using the approach that we have uh, just shown, that, okay, uh, can, can I compress two rows at once, or three rows at once, or four rows at once? If I do that, if I go all the way to the four rows, can you see the amount of power I will be saving per neuron will be only uh, uh, the am amount of uh, power reduction that I'll achieve will be in the order of, let's say, 87%. 87% is a, is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of power. And of course, because it is not only the power, power multiplied by latency is your energy. You're also saving on latency as well. Latency is almost five times faster. So if you, if you save 87% on the power, and if you save uh, almost, uh, let's say, uh, you know, five times uh, in terms of the latency, your energy is almost order of a few, a few orders of magnitudes uh, smaller than the original one, right? But the question here is that by doing the approximate uh, neural network design, did I lose the accuracy? Surprisingly, no, because this is the fascinating uh, thing about neural network. They always know how to mitigate the, let's say, the loss of precision from one layer to the loss of precision into the other layer. One of them will uh, you know, look after the other. They will automatically look after each other. Uh, look at this. If you had the original configuration of your uh, neural network, you had 97% accuracy for a certain uh, image recognition problem. Uh, this is the MNIST problem. Some of you will have heard. This is a hand re uh, character recognition problem, 97%. Uh, and if you look at the, uh, the using the SDLC4, you only lost the accuracy by 5%. It may not be. If, it is, if you're looking at the energy number or the power number, this may, it may be a motivating factor for you to use uh, that kind of uh, neural network configuration. So this has been uh, published in uh, Date, uh, SIPs, and some of the other uh, you know, high-profile uh, uh, transactions. Now, this is a recent work that we have done. Uh, again, we, we went back to the basic. We asked ourselves the question. The, again, um, the basic notion of, the basic problem with neural networks is that we have a lot of arithmetic. And arithmetics, uh, we, we like designing arithmetics on the algorithm, but circuit designers like me, uh, we, 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 are, we are biased towards energy efficiency because uh, we know that energy efficiency is the biggest enabler for uh, making applications. Your smartphone is possible today because of energy efficiency. Your gadgets, gaming devices, portable devices, gaming devices, all of these things that you have uh, been using at home, they had been possible because of energy efficiency. So energy efficiency is the biggest drive for uh, the, uh, the, the uh, making an application possible. Now, again, I'll not go into a lot of details, but um, uh, if you know a bit of a um, uh, circuit design approach, again, I, uh, I'm expecting that if you, if you, if you use two complementary components here, over here, for example, you have a PMOS and you have an NMOS and you get them together and you supply some kind of, uh, let's say, pulse with modulated signal. What happens is that you also get a pulse with modulated signal at the output as well, right? Because it is a NOT gate. It is basically a NOT gate. So you also get a pulse with modulated signal at the output. But if you put, a, a, so let's say, an RC circuit over here, a resistive and capacitive circuit over here, what it does is that it smooths out the, the instead of having really sharp edges of your pulse, it smooths out those parts because, because these, are, these are delay components, right? So you'll have something like this. It will look something like this, right? Something like this. 
Now, take note here. What are we doing here? If we can somehow control the timing between the on time and off time of my path with modulated signal at the input, I can control the effective voltage at the output. Okay? So if I can somehow define the duty cycle, I call it. Duty cycle is the ratio between on time and off time. If I can define the duty cycle at the input, I can control the voltage at the output. Okay? Now, what does it do for us? The beauty, thing, beauty here is that if I can somehow express my input as a duty cycle, as a duty cycle over here, I can do arithmetic in the time domain as opposed to the binary domain. How? Uh, as you can see over here, for example, the, if I have a circuit like this, I'll just try and remove this for you. So if I have a circuit like this, this is one inverter, this is another inverter, and this is another inverter. So I've got a weight W11 here, weight W21 over here, weight W31 over here. Let's say these are all individual switches. It's basically telling me whether I want this inverter to be on or I want this inverter to be off or not. Now, if I put these three inverters on with a certain duty cycle, the output, all of these outputs will be accumulated across this capacitor, right? So in effect, what it will mean is that you have the impact of, let's say W11 multiplied by input one, W21 multiplied by input two, and W31 multiplied by X1 and uh, the, the uh, input three and so on. That effect will be here right away. Can you see, I have replaced a very complex arithmetic, uh, very complex uh, uh, digital arithmetic by a temporarily, uh, temporarily built logic. This is so fast that we can, uh, we can possibly design a new way of uh, doing neural networks. I'm just uh, comparing over here, for example, we did uh, again design an entire uh, hand character recognition circuit. Uh, it was a massive, massive work because it took us about, uh, uh, you know, in the order of, let's say, uh, more, you know, 13, 14 months, more than a year. So we looked at uh, various features, for example, uh, you know, because it is temporal, you can now vary your VDD or uh, voltage or frequency elastically. You know, in normal digital circuits, you have discrete points. This is your VDD, this is your voltage, this is your frequency, this is your voltage, this is your frequency, and so on. And that really hurts your actual, uh, you know, uh, circuit operations because often you you spend a lot of time uh, defining these discrete levels, and you, it'll waste a lot of power. You don't need to do that right here because the arithmetic is happening right in the uh, the, the, the mixed uh, uh, signal or the analog domain right away. So it is dynamic in terms of the uh, voltage and frequency variations. It is also incredibly power efficient. As you can see, the traditional uh, deep neural network will have. Uh, typically, the uh, energy consumption will be in the order of, let's say, 7.5 milliwatts. And here we have an extreme uh, sweep of, let's say, one microwatt all the way to something like 205,000, uh, 2,500 uh, 2, uh, microwatts altogether. That's about 7,000 le uh, times less, almost. Okay. We can also use different types of uh, an activation functions. I did not talk a lot about activation functions. Activation functions are basically a method of uh, containing your weight updates in your neural networks. Okay. It can, it can contain your weight updates in a, in a non-linear space, in an exponential space, you know, carved by sigmoid. Or you can also do it the same thing in a, in a ReLU space, which is a, a bit more linear and allows you to have a better fit at uh, times, right? Uh, and we did not lose a lot of accuracy by doing the temporal accuracy, uh, temporal logic over here. Of course, uh, there were times when we had a training accuracy of, let's say, 60%. But if you allow more time for the training, you actually achieve as high as, let's say, 90 or 92% as well. So it's, it's possible. Okay, now the nugget here is that everything has to have a merit and also obviously you can't get a free lunch every time. So you also need to, uh, need to consider the demerit. Demerit is that uh, you may not always have a guaranteed accuracy for that kind of application because you need to operate for longer. But the merit is that the energy consumption is significantly uh, less compared to the traditional approach. Okay. Now, uh, am I with everyone, Shiav? Can you hear me all? Shihab? Yes, we can. Good, good. I just wanted to make sure that uh, we are all, all, all together. I'm not making you sleep through my circuit design stuff. Uh, now, my friends, we have big, big challenges when it comes to the uh, AI research, AI circuit design research. I'm just giving you an example here. 
this is an incredible uh, figure generated by us uh, as a nature communications uh, article a few days back actually uh, not a few days back a few months back i would say uh, the amount of human carbon footprint over a year is of the order of let's say a thousand uh, thousand pounds yeah uh, so 10,000 10, pounds over a year and if you travel from new york to san francisco over a flight your carbon footprint of the will be of the order of let's say 100 uh, um, sorry 1000 1000 uh, uh, you know pounds but if you look at the natural language processing neural network training the amount of hyperparameter search you have to do amount of computation you have to do amount of training you have to do amount of data that you have to throw in the amount of computational power that you'll be burning all of them will be converted to something like 80000 pounds or carbon uh, carbon dioxide footprint that's an amazingly high footprint if you think about it. So natural language processing is basically the one that you, you know, when I'm talking to my phone, I'm saying, okay, Google, can you tell me where is Newcastle? Google then tells me that, okay, go this way, go that way and so on. So that notion of natural language processing, I'm speaking to my phone and my phone is recognizing my voice. This is called natural language processing, right? Uh, how your uh, in your voice uh, in in natural terms and accents can be uh, you know uh, processed in real time. For that application alone, we have burned almost eight times more um, eight, eight years of worth, uh, let's say, carbon dioxide footprint. Uh, 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 you know, compared to the human lives uh, in one year. That is not a good news because this, I'm talking about an application which is only a mid uh, midway through kind of application. We are not talking about a really uh, large application here definition uh, real-time image processing they will probably take uh, you know 10 to 20 times more uh, if you look if you're looking at let's say cracking genomics uh, massive genomics or cracking something like uh, you know incredibly high order uh, dimensionality kind of uh, data sets they will probably take even 100 or 200 times more now energy efficiency unfortunately is one of the biggest uh, hindrances uh, when it comes to the uh, enabling AI if you want more capability, more performance, unfortunately, your uh, energy grows exponentially. That is not a good news. If we want AI to be anywhere and everywhere, we need to make sure that energy is something that we can control on, right? And another big challenge that we have right now is uh, the fact that uh, we all know how to download some, uh, you know, uh, some algorithms from somewhere else and you know craft something else in and uh, and then we throw it into the smart devices somewhere without knowing am i is my ai application capable of taking responsibility or not what if you had an autonomous driving application where you have no option for you to stop but you have a situation where a child and an old elderly woman both of them are passing across the road uh, and you also have three passengers on your on your car. What will you do? Um, you can't possibly, you know, all of these are really impossible options. You can't possibly hit the uh, hit the roadside uh, and kill three passengers on your car. You can't possibly kill that uh, elderly woman, and you can obviously not kill, uh, God forbid, that little child. Unfortunately, there's a lot of buzz around uh, you know, Tesla, autonomous driving, and all of these other guys, but uh, you know, we are far off when it comes to explainability. We don't know how to take responsibility when it comes to AI. Uh, this is the reason why we cannot take responsibility is that I go back to my neural network theory again. If I have a bad decision made, I have to go back to my bad decision. I have to find out all these stochastic paths that led to the bad decision. And I have to find out which sensor or which input type had given me that bad decision. Now, if I give you a neural network which has, let's say, dimensionality of several billions, it will take an entire human life to find out this stochasticity that will have uh, you know, given you that kind of decision. So neural network is uh, not the right choice, you know, right choice when it comes to explainability. So that is one of the reasons why uh, in my group, we have started uh, uh, pioneering a uh, new solution because we remember there, there are two things we're looking at, energy efficiency and explainability. So what we th thought is that, okay, if I go move away from the arithmetic approach to something like a logic approach, something where I could actually look at the uh, you know, relationship between the output to the input by logic gates rather than arithmetic, multiplication arithmetic, 
I can actually make the explainable uh, process a lot simpler because I will then have to go through some and and or and 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 or operations rather than multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add with different uh, values and options. Now, uh, this is a very new approach because uh, uh, Mikhail Settlin is the original um, innovator for uh, Settlin Automata or uh, the uh, learning automata. 1963. This uh, unassuming gentleman, Mikhail Settlin, he never knew that uh, what he uh, designed in 1963 will be an instrument for um, you know, designing a powerful AI in the 90, uh, 2020s. Um, we picked up on his work, uh, I would say, shamefully a lot later. We should have picked up on, the, on his work a uh, uh, lot, uh, lot earlier. He had actually already professed that, okay, there is a way of doing AI, uh, avoiding uh, arithmetic altogether. So what it does is that we have the raw input data, you throw in uh, the raw input data, uh, then you, instead of doing binarization, what you do is something called Booleanization, right? In binarization, what happens is that if it is four, I say zero, one, zero, zero, right? So zero, one, zero, zero transcribes or translates into four. But in Booleanization, four could be zero, one, 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 because it's basically creating Boolean features out of a raw data. Okay, it's not about the positional significance, it's about the Boolean features that you generate. So once you generate the Boolean features, then you, what you do is the, if you have, let's say five uh, Boolean features, you'll be creating five plus their in, uh, complementary literals. You'll be uh, generating 10 different literals, okay? 10 different literals, and they'll be going in, in, in this particular dimension of your crossbar, which is the, let's say, X direction of your crossbar. And then you will have, for each of these, you will have for each of these, you will have one settling automaton. Or, or what settling automaton really does is that it creates a machine, state machine. Uh, we call it in circuit terms, so we call it state machine. State machine allows me to say whether I want to take that literal, whether I want to include that literal in my definition of machine learning or not. So I've got, let's say, uh, one particular uh, set of features. I want to say I want to include zero. I don't want to include one. I want to include this zero. I, don't, I want to include this one, but I don't want to include this one for defining a certain uh, relation, uh, relationship between the output inference and the input data. For the next one, I might as well decide I want to include this one, I don't want to include this one, I don't want to include this one, and so on. So by including and not including is basically not gated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, we, if, if I don't want to include anything else, I just say not. Okay. And if I want to include something else, I say and. So it's simply as simple as logic gates. And by doing the logic case, what I have is that in each crossbar will be within a certain clause. We call it a clause. Clause is basically a collection of settling automata corresponding to the input by Boolean features. And then I'll, uh, just like the neural network, in neural network, we create these stochastic pathways, many, many stochastic pathways. We also throw many, many clauses. So to allow the system to more and learn different combinations of logic, that allows me to learn my output output uh, output solution, and then I do some sort of majority voting. If most of the clauses say okay, I agree to those clauses that okay, uh, this particular problem can be defined by that logic formulation with the uh, booleanized features. They do all the majority voting, and majority voting cannot go wrong because if a majority of them vote for it, it's very likely that it is the right solution. Okay, so. The actual uh, state machine is over here. State machine, this is a sim very simple example of a uh, separate automata with uh, six states. Initially, you start with a random state, but depending on whether, uh, you, uh, when, you're, when you're training it, uh, depending on how much error you have, you either go left, which is rewarding, or you go right, uh, which is penalizing, okay? So you do some sort of reinforcement over time as you, as you start learning it. And uh, once you have learned it, you have a fantastic crossbar-based solutions which, is, uh, which allows you to have, number one, very lean way of uh, doing machine learning using logic. And number two, you can also do powerful uh, explainable models. For example, you can go from the output to the input by logic, rather than really complex W1, X1, W2, X2, W1 million, uh, X1 million, and so on. You will never get anywhere because the number of possibilities you can have for those things is incredibly high. Right, the number of w, uh, w values and also the x values that you can have. It's impossible. So for the first time, uh, we're very proud that uh, we have gen generated a, a AI solution. These are still early days, 
we, we have a lot of uh, researchers working within the team. But the first time we have now designed a solution that is uh, capable of addressing two things at the same time, explainability as well as energy efficiency. Now, let's see how it fares. Uh, the, again, uh, th these numbers are from our first uh, microchip that we have designed. Uh, we're very proud that uh, we are also designing uh, the second microchip. Uh, by the way, designing microchip is a very expensive process. Um, it takes, uh, uh, you're looking at at least uh, 50 months of uh, human efforts altogether for designing one uh, rational uh, microchip. And then also, uh, you know, the amount of uh, post-term uh, fabrication processing you have to do is incredibly high as well. So we've designed the first microchip and uh, we've been able to compare with some of the uh, traditional approaches. This is the standard neural network when you do the training. Again, this is the standard neural network when you do the classification. Remember, uh, training and classification are different things. In training, you go through all the possibilities of weight updates, all of them, all the possibilities of different hyperparameter, uh, hyperparameters that you have. But in classification, you have already learned your weights. You have already got your hyperparameters. Everything is settled. All you, all you do is you take the input, you multiply and add, and you get the output, okay? So the energy efficiency is the lowest for the standard uh, uh, neural network in terms of training, slightly better in terms of the classification because it is not as arithmetically intensive. Uh, we now have a new kind of learning method which is called binarized neural network. What it means is that uh, uh, the, the, this is a new kind of neural network where what they do is that they contain the values of the weight updates to only plus one or minus one, okay? And if you do plus one and minus one, it's, it's, it's a bit like you either go uh, on the right or you go on the completely complementary way, which is the uh, go left. You either becoming an add operation or you become a, a subtract operation. So binarized neural network allows you to do a very low, um, you know, uh, use the inputs, uh, define the inputs in a very low, uh, low end kind of precision. And then you use that to basically create some sort of a very uh, powerful, uh, less complex uh, neural networks using a very simple uh, binarized logic. So that is the, the classification part of the binarized neural network, BNNs. It's pretty, uh, pretty efficient in terms of the energy efficiency. You can go all the way up to, let's say, 44 or 42 uh, tera operations per joule. This is basically saying how many uh, multiply or how many learning operations you can do per joule. Okay. But look at the uh, solutions that we have generated. So for the Mignon AI, I, we, our solution is called Mignon for a reason because Mignon is a French word for uh, basically meaning uh, small and beautiful, beautiful and small. It is beautiful because if you look at the, uh, I'll show you the artwork in a minute. Uh, internally, if you look at the uh, logic artwork, it's, it's basically just crossbars, it's beautiful. And uh, when you look at the uh, artworks. So the training efficiency is about, uh, let's say close to 50 tera operations per joule. And the, uh, sorry, this is the classification efficiency really, uh, the rightmost one, classification efficiency is of the order of, let's say 63, Tera operations per joule. Incredibly energy efficient. Amazing. We have still been doing some work on the explainability and we've got some uh, articles uh, and I've considered. This is the artwork. This is the first microchip we have uh, designed. Um, it looks like a flower, I suppose. Uh, I really like it. I don't know how, how much you like it, but I really like it because uh, uh, this is um, less than 2.5 square uh, millimeter microchip. It's basically, uh, you know, something uh, the order of your fingertip uh, and it can do flower detection algorithms uh, it looks like a flower and it does flower detection as well so this is a microchip it is uh, it has proven to be uh, incredibly energy efficient and we are waiting for the app to come back so that we can uh, we can test it we can uh, do uh, a lot more work on this one we had been invited by uh, nature electronics to write uh, uh, a feature article on the settled machine but uh, this is something we are working on right now uh, I'm, I'm really proud to say that uh, the core team, the, my, this is my RA, Adrian uh, Wilden, and this is also my uh, colleague, uh, Alex uh, Jakoblev, um, led by me. Uh, this team is now going towards uh, a spin out initiative. We are, uh, you know, uh, we, we're led by the university's uh, commercialization team. We are now going forward with the ambition of doing a startup uh, out of this one as well. Okay. If you are interested in um, the space of, let's say, the machine learning research that we have done, there are lots and lots of papers, but I, I don't want to overwhelm you with uh, too many. Sometimes it's very, very useful to read a magazine-like paper. Okay, Reading a transactions or uh, really solid uh, transaction paper can be quite uh, complicated. Some start with something like a magazine paper, something like a feature article where you can understand what this uh, is, is going to be about. 
So we've got a good number of uh, magazine papers as well as some transactions. Go ahead and read them if you have, uh, you know, if you're interested. I'll be happy to talk about uh, any of the aspects uh, of our research uh, as you as you as you as you see it. I, I hope I didn't blow out the timings. Um, still very early morning here. Um, I think when I sat down here, it was 6.15, now it is 7.55. It's a long time, isn't it? I'm done. Jiha, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for a very, very nice and informative talk. And it's really incredible, the, the, the work that you are doing. I think it's kind of, uh, kind of a, in a very new dimension. And also, thanks to clarify some of these misconceptions that we often have uh, about uh, AI and because it's been such a buzzword that many people are using that maybe we, we, we kind of get confused sometimes. So now I would like to, uh, we have around, we'd like to finish in, let's say, in next uh, 10 minutes, within 10 minutes. So if somebody has any question, you may raise your hand. Yes, yeah, so Saitan, we, yeah, you, you, you can go ahead. Hello, sir. I actually had a question about this uh, binary neural network, uh, about how it is optimized. Uh, we are only working on zeros or ones, binary values. So do, yes. we, do we still use the Cartesian distance-based based optimization or we, do we move to something simpler like Hamming distance or something like that? Good question. Uh, I think uh, majority of the uh, BNN research is still using Cartesian. Uh, but I've, I've seen some uh, growing presence of uh, using simpler logics in the in favor of explainability as I just mentioned Cartesian uh, you know methods are slightly more agnostic in terms of explainability uh, but this is a, as I said BNN has only evolved in the last two three years uh, there's a lot of research going on in this specification in the binarization and the and the generation of uh, products uh, error function formulation a lot of research going on so it's, it's a great uh, topic to work on so uh, keep an open mind Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Yeah, so any other question from anyone? If not, I, I actually I had one question for myself. So looking at your earlier work in uh, 2018, and what I can see that uh, you really, like you gained 87%, uh, like you use 87% less power, but the accuracy went down and for, Four percent, and you, you say that it's, it's really important to for the applicability of something. But I, 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 I my question is that because when we talk about uh, some kind of AI-based application, we maybe for for a user point of view, the accuracy is very important because I mean, if if it's not really, it's a, such a sensitive thing because if it's making few mistakes but still making mistakes, maybe it's not usable at all. So yeah. how you cope with like many, I, I think you get these questions many times. So, so what, yeah. what is your normal answer to that? Okay, um, I think uh, yeah, Shihab, you will appreciate the fact that uh, AI has been now used for very many kinds of applications, okay? If, it, if, if you're willing to use, let's say, uh, the application in a biomedical uh, space, obviously accuracy is incredibly important. But if it is something like, for example, voice recognition or um, recognition of, uh, you know, images, you know, artifact detection in, in images, you can probably take a 5% hit in favor of, let's say, 20, 20 times energy efficiency yeah. because you're running it on your mobile. Uh, have you often noticed that when you say, okay, Google, or followed by a certain keyword, that uh, your keyword is not right, but you say it again, right? Yeah. So you see, users, uh, you know, certain applications have this natural uh, morphing capability. Users adapt to the fact that there is less accuracy. So uh, yes, you're absolutely right. These kinds of applications are suitable for, uh, uh, you know, uh, for domains where users can tolerate that kind of uh, accuracy loss in favor of the energy efficiency, obviously. Okay, great. And, and have, you, have you ever measured, like, kind of in a larger scale, like how, how much carbon footprint can you save if you had, like, can you give some numbers, like, if you have your chips being used in, let's okay. say. Um, so, if I'm, I'm going by, uh, we haven't really measured the carbon footprints, but uh, I'm going by the numbers that I've presented over here. I think uh, you'll appreciate that uh, the problems. Uh, here you go. Now, uh, NLP neural network uh, 
consumes about, let's say, 80,000 pounds of uh, carbon dioxide footprint. Okay? Uh, and if I go by the numbers, uh, if, if I, we, it, that is neural network, obviously, and we were able to reduce the energy consumption by 20 times. So you're looking at the carbon, uh, carbon dioxide footprint, which is 20 times less than that, uh, roughly about, let's say, uh, 2,000 uh, pounds of carbon dioxide footprint. Yeah, that, that, that's really, really great because I, I was also like personally, I had been in one PhD defense where the work was about kind of like a green server or something that, and, and at the first time I was aware that we are really burning so much energy, uh, which Absolutely. and we were not really aware of it. You know, the, the, the funny thing is that uh, we have now, obviously, you know, the AI expands anywhere and everywhere these days. You have AI on a tiny device. You also have AI on uh, very expensive cloud servers uh, provided by Google or Amazon or somewhere else. Okay. Now, uh, if you were to do a, a, a tiny application on a cloud, uh, you know, a server, if you're training some uh, tiny application on a cloud server, the amount of uh, computational power that you burn is several uh, orders of magnitude higher than that you do for a tiny device, right? Yeah. So there is now this new community, uh, a community called Continuous Learning Community. What they're saying is that, can we learn on the device rather than using the cloud for training the system, right? Yeah. If you can learn on the device, we can still have the carbon dioxide footprint or energy footprint will be so low that we don't have to worry about uh, offloading it to a server, okay? This is a new domain. Uh, obviously, on-chip learning or continuous learning is very challenging because you have to have the right kind of architecture for that and the computational power of that kind of uh, little device as well. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of uh, prospect in uh, AI research at the moment because, uh, you know, as it stands, everything is uh, dominated by the server-based approach. You throw everything else on the server, train it in the server, and then you use it in, the, in some, uh, you know, inference can be used somewhere else. But the, the future is, is really in the energy uh, reduction, uh, explainable research, uh, possibly uh, newer ways of doing things in the more effectively with higher accuracy and so on. Great. So I, I think we, we can fi finish soon. So if anyone doesn't have any question, I don't see any raising hands. So I like to really thank uh, Dr. Richard Sofik for waking up early and agreeing to share his work with us. It has been really incredible to see uh, such an advancement in this technology. And I think you, you had been a kind of a record nice bridge between the computer science people and electrical engineers and because we often think uh, from being an electrical engineer we're left out of this AI and deep learning but now I think we, we, we can see the bridge and I hope in the future we, we get opportunity to collaborate and, and share some of our work together. Absolutely, anytime, anytime. anytime. And thank you really, uh, thank, thanks a lot and thanks everyone for being with us and, and hopefully you have uh, got some good information from here and so I think we're going to finish and so thank you and have a nice lunch in Bangladesh and maybe we have breakfast for Dr. Richard Shafiq. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Bye. Okay. Bye.